Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel. We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today in the book of Leviticus, chapter 2, verse 5. In the Hebrew language, the name of the book, Bayikara, and it means, and he called. And the Lord did call his people to be holy because he was holy. And many would ask, well, you know, you're Christians. What are you doing studying the law? The, Jesus Christ changed the law. Jesus did not change the law. The law is still very much in effect. Uh, thou shalt not kill, which should have been translated, thou shalt do no murder, uh, thou shalt not steal. Uh, those are still in effect. Now, the ordinances, that's another matter. And what we're studying here in Leviticus, to a great part, are the ordinances, the blood ordinances, to be more specific. And Jesus Christ, his crucifixion on the cross, did change the ordinances. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, we learned that uh, the blood ordinances, uh, which are the blood sacrifices, uh, were nailed to his cross. So the law is still very much in effect. The ordinances, on the other hand, did change. It would be uh, an abomination to our Heavenly Father for someone to offer a blood sacrifice to Him at this point in time now that the supreme sacrifice, the sacrifice for one and all time, Jesus Christ, the Lamb slain on the cross, took place. Uh, the purpose, and we left off in our uh, last lecture, we had been just started in chapter 2, and we were, were talking there about the meat or meal sacrifices or offerings. And that in the Hebrew tongue is minka. Uh, minka, the purpose of the minka offering was to obtain favor from our Heavenly Father. So with that introduction, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day as we pick it up. Chapter 2, verse 5 of Leviticus and it reads, And if thy oblation be a meat offering, minka in the Hebrew, bacon in a pan, it shall be of fine flour unleavened mingled with oil. Uh, bacon in a pan uh, tried by fire, uh, just as Jesus was tried by fire throughout his entire life. They crucified him. Now, I asked you to think in our last lecture spiritually about these and look for the types for Jesus, the fine flour, uh, not necessarily just finely sifted, but as any of the offerings, it was to be your best. It was not to be uneven or clumpy, if you will. And of course, what do you do with flour? You make bread. And spiritually speaking, bread is what God gives us in His Word, uh, the manna, if you will. And the, the, of course, the, Jesus being the bread of life, if you look at it spiritually, the oil always symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And the oil being mingled in through the bread, uh, the Holy Spirit, if you will, mingled in with the bread of life and God's Word, you have all the spiritual food you need to be satisfied. And when I think of being spiritually fed, I, I can't help but always think about uh, taking Holy Communion. Uh, when we have our Passover celebration each year, uh, we also conduct a communion service for the television audience, but how you feel clean inside and out, uh, how you feel satisfied, spiritually fed. Verse 6, Thou shalt part it in pieces and pour oil thereon. It is a meat offering, minka. And this is talking about once 
the uh, cakes, if you will. That, by the way, I meant to mention in verse 5, that pan there is more like a flat griddle, uh, something similar to what you might make pancakes on. And this group of minka, uh, you're talking pastries, ba basically. And in the next verse or two, we're going to be talking about uh, the minka offering being deep fried in oil, much as we would uh, make donuts today. So uh, very much, uh, uh, and you have three uh, types of minka offerings, this group that we're talking about here, the second. There will be a third, <clears throat> but uh, the, the, once the bread was uh, baked or cooked uh, on this flat griddle, uh, then it was to be broken uh, and then the oil poured on it and that then was offered. Verse 7, And if thy oblation be a meat offering, bacon in a frying pan, it shall be made of fine flour and oil. Now this a frying pan, more of a, a deep stew pan or uh, a boiling pan. And this is where they would drop the bread mingled with the oil into, or probably into boiling oil itself and would cook uh, it perfect just as Christ was perfect. Verse 8, And thou shalt bring the meat offering that is made of these things unto the Lord. The these things here being those mentioned in verses 4 through 7. And when it is presented unto the priest, he shall bring it unto the altar, and this uh, to be placed on the altar of burnt offering as a sweet savor to the Lord. The first three chapters of Leviticus, I'll remind you, have to do with the savor offerings, meaning that they were offered on the altar of burnt offering, and the smoke as it would ascend, the very meaning of some of the words, uh, Ola in the Hebrew, but it would ascend to the Lord and be a sweet savor unto Him. And that's the reason they're called the savor offerings. Verse 9, And the priest shall take from the meat offering a memorial thereof, and shall burn it upon the altar. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. And this burn it is katar in the Hebrew language. And it, it, it also means to ascend as the smoke would ascend to our Heavenly Father, but it also means to turn to vapor. So uh, you could imagine the priest uh, taking a handful of the, hot, the fine flour uh, intermingling some of the oil with it and then tossing the handful over the open uh, burning fire on the altar of burnt offering and poof, it, it would vaporize. Verse 10, And that which is left of the meat offering, the minka, shall be Aaron's and his sons. It was the priest. It is a thing most holy of the offerings of the Lord made by fire. And uh, the fact that it was most holy, uh, indicating that it was meant to be consumed by Aaron and his sons, by the priests only, and only in a holy place, sanctified as clean and set apart for that use. And we talked in our last lecture, toward the end of the lecture, about there being seven holy things in God's Word, and four of those seven were most holy. Now, once this bread, let's call it, uh, the minka offering, had been sanctified to the Lord, had a, uh, a commoner, uh, a lay person, in other words, not a priest, eaten it, it would have defiled the, the sacredness of the bread, the offering to the Lord. Once it's offered to the Lord, it's holy, and therefore the priest only were to uh, partake of it. Verse 11, No meat offering which ye shall bring unto the Lord shall be made with leaven, for ye shall burn no leaven nor any honey in any offering of the Lord made by fire. Now, the purpose of this, the leaven uh, and the honey uh, have characteristics that they cause fermentation. And you could think of fermentation as corruption. 
and in no way should an offering, which is a type for Jesus Christ, be corrupt. He was not corrupt. Uh, those types that uh, and the offerings should not be corrupting either. The leaven, uh, I can't help every time I think of leaven and bread, I can't help but think about Jesus uh, teaching in Matthew chapter 16, verse 12. And he's teaching his disciples there to beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he started off by saying that it was leaven, it was like leaven in bread. And what he was saying is, say the church is a loaf of bread. And when you place a little bit of leaven in it, it permeates throughout the whole loaf, the whole church, in other words, symbolically. And what is happening was the scribes and Pharisees, they had had the traditions of men taken over and basically made null and void the word of God. And what Jesus was teaching his disciples and us was to beware of those who are false teachers uh, because a little bit of false teaching, just like leaven permeates throughout the whole loaf, a little bit of false teaching permeates throughout the whole church. But anything that was placed on the altar of burnt offering to the Lord, in other words, was not to have leaven or honey in it. Uh, but there are part of this minka offering that were not intended to go on the altar of burnt offering, but were for the priest and the priest alone to partake of. In that case, they were allowed to offer it with leaven and uh, or honey. Honey, as a matter of fact, one of the uh, items listed as a first fruit offering, uh, which was for the priest maintenance, verse 12. As for the oblation of the first fruits, you shall offer them unto the Lord, the them here being the honey and the leaven. In other words, first fruits were not to be placed on the altar of burnt offering, but were for the priest to consume. You're okay to put honey and leaven in that. <clears throat> but they shall not be burnt on the altar for a sweet savor. Verse 13. And every oblation of thy meat offering shalt thou season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from thy meat offering. For all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. Now, some scholars think that this applies to uh, the minka offerings only. Uh, I, I don't read it that way. It says, with all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. In Hebrew, in the salt in the Hebrew is milak. Now, what does salt do? Well, salt preserves things. It increases the, the, the longevity of something. Take meat, for example. Uh, cowboys in the olden days, they didn't carry a refrigerator with them on the, their horse. Uh, what did they do? They would take salted beef, much similar probably to what we would think of as beef jerky. Uh, they'd throw a bag of it in their saddlebags and it would last for days if not weeks uh, and, and not be uh, where they couldn't eat it. Salt also uh, strengthens. Uh, I can't help but think of Mark chapter 9 verses 49 and 50 where Jesus says and refers to this, that you're to put salt in all your offerings. But then he continues on in Mark 9, chapter 50, that Christians are to be salty. Uh, in other words, when you go into a room, you should make a difference. You, the salt changes the flavor of food. Uh, Christians should change uh, the attitude and the spirit in a room when they enter. It should be obvious that a Christian has entered the room. Uh, Christians make a difference. <clears throat> Christians should be salty. Verse 14, And if thou offer a meat offering of thy first fruits, and this is the third type of minka that we're talking about here, unto the Lord thou shalt offer for the meat offering of thy first fruit green ears of corn, 
dried by the fire, even corn beaten out of full ears. This word beaten uh, hit home with me uh, when we're looking for types for Jesus Christ. Uh, he was indeed beaten. He took the stripes and we get the healing. These green ears in the Hebrew is abid, very similar close word, a form of the word that many of you are familiar that who are familiar with the Hebrew calendar, you know the first month of the year is Abib, and uh, Abib b being uh, coming about at the time of the year when these green ears would be coming into season. <clears throat> Verse 15, But thou shalt put oil upon it, and lay frankincense thereon. It is a meat offering, no leaven or honey, as this was a memorial of it, was to be placed on the altar of burnt offering. But again, uh, the oil, always again symbolic of the Holy Spirit, the incense, uh, the, the, when they burned incense, it was seen as taking the prayers of the people uh, uh, up to the Lord. Verse 16, And the priest shall burn the, mor the memorial of it, part of the beaten corn thereof, and part of the oil thereof, with all the frankincense thereof. It is an offering made by fire unto the Lord. And again, spiritually, the incense, the prayers of the people going up to the people, uh, up to the Lord, the oil, uh, symbolic of the Holy Spirit. But uh, we have physical food that is necessary to sustain life, we have spiritual food, and that's what I ask you to think about when you think about the minka, the, the, the fine flour utilized to make the bread, uh, symbolic of God's Word, if you will, and if you have the Holy Spirit and God's Word uh, and the type for Jesus Christ, you have everything to, that you need to be fed very well spiritually. Now in chapter 3, we come to our third type of savor offering, and it's the peace offering, also called a thank offering. Now, many people would think, well, they must have done thank offerings and peace offerings in the good times for uh, thanking God for the peace enjoyed. Not necessarily always the case. It can be, in, in, in the case of the peace offerings, that they're hoping for peace. In other words, it could be in good times, it could be in hard times that someone would offer a peace offering. Also, it's a, the thank offering, uh, a thanks for the salvation or deliverance that our Father provides. And, and especially in the case when you have hard times, you might make a thank or peace offering to the Lord in hopes that He would deliver you. Let's go with chapter 3, verse 1, and it reads, And if His, the offerer's oblation, this is Corban in the Hebrew, be a sacrifice of peace offering, if He offer it of the herd, whether it be male or female, He shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. Now you remember in chapter 1, the burnt offering had to be a male. Here the offerer had the option of offering a female or a male. And of course of the herd in the Hebrew, bakar means of the beef cattle or oxen. Uh, the peace offering, uh, the word, Hebrew word that probably more people who don't speak Hebrew would recognize is shalom. Shalom, of course, means peace. The word for peace offering in the Hebrew, a form of that word, shalem, and uh, again, shalom meaning peace, shalem meaning the peace offering. Verse 2, And he, the offerer, shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. Again, this would be a motion of slinging some of the blood toward the side of the altar. And 
again, I ask for you to look for the types in this. It's, it's not something that we do today. And uh, again, I want to be uh, guilty of overstating what I'm about to say that rather than understating it, you youngsters, God does not want you to kill animals and you should not do so thinking you're going to be pleasing to God. That's not the way that we worship God. This is the way that they worship God during this dispensation of time when man lived under the law. We live under a dis different set of rules now. We live in the dispensation of grace. But once the, the blood had been spilled, it had been sanctified to the Lord. So at that point, only the priest would, would handle it. Verse 3. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Ishe in the Hebrew, any offering made by fire. The fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. Now, as opposed to the <clears throat> burnt offering where the whole animal basically was put on the altar, here just the fat, and this specifically is talking uh, more about the suet, which is a hard fat, about the kidneys and the loins. <clears throat> and covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. And we learn in verse 16 that uh, all the fat belongs to God. Verse 4, And the two kidneys and the fat that is on them which is by the flanks, or the loin, we would more be familiar with, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away, the offerer, in other words. The call is a lobe or flap uh, over the liver. It's often called uh, the, the liver sack. Verse 5, And Aaron's son shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, a savor of satisfaction. Now, this might confuse some. What, what do you mean you're going to put it on the burnt sacrifice? Uh, what if somebody had not made a burnt sacrifice that day before this person was making a peace offering? Well, there would always be a morning sacrifice and an evening sacrifice. So there would be very few times that you wouldn't have uh, a burnt sacrifice on the altar of burnt offering. And as you can imagine, these, the altar had to be fairly large when you're talking about uh, putting a whole uh, beef cattle on it. And at times of the year, there were more, many, many more than one person making an offering. Uh, uh, the dedication of the temple comes to mind during the time of Solomon. And what they would do is set up supplemental altars, and uh, even some points, uh, they didn't have enough priests to make the offering, so the Levitical priest, excuse me, the Levites, were sanctified to help the priest. Verse 6, And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Again, of the sheep or the goats, a female or a male acceptable. Uh, in this case, during the, in chapter 1, the sheep and the goats were, the instructions were, uh, given to us all together. Uh, here in the peace offering, we're going to see that a different set of instructions applies to the sheep from the goats. And the reason is we have a difference in the anatomy of the sheep and goats. Verse 7, And if he offer a lamb for his offering, then shall he offer it before the Lord. And of course, the lamb slain uh, Jesus Christ became the sacrifice for one and all time. Verse 8, And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering, uh, transferring the unworthiness uh, to the animal, the innocence of the animal to the offerer, and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. 
and Aaron's son shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. Verse 9, And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat thereof, as with the beef or the oxen. And the whole rump it shall he take off hard or close to the backbone. And the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards. Now, this, let me need some explanation. Uh, this whole rump, uh, also known as a fat tail. Now, sheep in different parts of the world, some of them have this fat tail. Uh, even to this day in, in the area of Palestine, all sheep would have this, be this broad-tailed or fat-tailed species of sheep. And in fact, in some, in some cases, it's, it's like a, a fatty substance, almost like uh, bone marrow, you could think of it. And it can grow up to 15 pounds in weight. And even to this day, some people, farmers, agriculturalists, make a little carriage with wheels so that the animal can get around better to graze, etc. Uh, ordinary sheep are also found in Arabia and Syria, but in modern uh, Palestine, again, they're of this broad tail or fat tail species. Verse 10. And the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, again the loin, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. Verse 4, just as with the beef or the oxen. Verse 11, And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. This word food in the Hebrew language is lechem, and it literally means bread. In chapter 7, uh, we'll learn what was done with the remaining portion of the beef, the sheep, and the goat uh, after the fat was removed and placed on the altar of burnt offering. And that, of course, was the sacrificial meal. The offerer would uh, invite friends, family, and uh, have a sacrificial meal, which was a very special meal, uh, entering into a very close communal relationship with their Heavenly Father. Uh, portions of the sacrifice, the, the peace and thank offerings, the wave breast and the heave shoulder, uh, were given to the priest and were considered the choicest uh, parts uh, to be consumed. And of course, that was the priest portion. Verse 12, And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And it doesn't state, but uh, male or female was acceptable uh, in the case of all peace or thank offerings. No pigeons uh, or turtle doves will be offered as was the case with the burnt offering for in chapter 1 for those who couldn't afford to offer an animal as expensive as a beef or an oxen or a goat or a sheep. They had the option of offering pigeons or turtle doves. And the reason that you don't read about pigeons or turtle doves being part of the thank offering is there wouldn't be enough to have a sacrificial meal uh, left over. Verse 13, He shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron as intercessors or me mediators between the people and God shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. The blood uh, became holy once it had been offered. Verse 14, And he shall offer thereof uh, his offering, even an offering made by fire unto the Lord, the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, as earlier described uh, for the sheep and also the beef. <clears throat> Verse 15, and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver 
with the kidneys it shall he take away, as again with the beef and the oxen and the sheep, identical. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is food, lechem, bread, if you will, in the Hebrew, of the offering made by fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's, not to be eaten by man. Why would it be that God would say man is not to eat fat? Well, you see, he made our bodies. He created us, and he knows what makes us tick. He knows what's healthy for us and what's not healthy. Uh, God knows that the fat uh, is a gathering point of, of purifying the body, if you will, but impurities, in other words, are caught up in the fat. And if you eat the fat, the fat will make you sick. Verse 17 to conclude the chapter. It shall be a perpetual statute for your generations throughout all your dwellings that you eat neither fat nor blood. And this verse often misunderstood. Many believe that this means that you shouldn't eat meat at all, that we should all be vegetarians. That's not the case. What this means, and it'll be clarified in a later chapter in the book of Leviticus, to eat an animal in its blood means that the animal has not been properly prepared to consume. And that means that the animal has not been properly bled. When you slaughter an animal to be consumed, you cut the animal's throat and let it bleed out. If you leave the blood in the animal, it putrefies and much, much more quickly. So uh, eating an animal in the blood uh, does not mean that not eating the blood does not mean you should not eat animals. How can I be so sure of that? Well, Leviticus chapter 11, where we're given the health laws in this same book of Leviticus, uh, we're told which animals are clean to eat and which animals are not clean to eat. So uh, I know a lot of this gets pretty heavy. Uh, we're going to try and keep it light. We're going to continue to look for our types uh, for Jesus Christ. And always remember, as Paul stated in the book of Galatians, the law is our schoolmaster that brings us to Jesus Christ. I encourage you to, to allow uh, the law to bring you to Jesus Christ. We got a short message in our next message. Message, we'll come back and cover. Uh, we're done with the savor offerings. We'll get into the sin and trespass offerings. It's interesting to note that the offerings that we've covered so far in the book of Leviticus had already been given to the people. That was not new information. Uh, in the book of Exodus, many of these offerings had already been uh, prescribed and the people were familiar with them. Uh, beginning with chapter 4, which we'll get into on our next lecture, it's all new information for the people of Israel. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment. Won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It's getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13 verse 8, many will be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. No shipping and handling. Just call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also mail your request to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the United States, of course, and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. Uh, we ask that you not ask questions about a specific denomination organization or individual by name. Uh, we try and teach God's Word in a positive format, 
uh, throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing, fully capable of all three. Uh, if you're listening by shortwave radio or studying via the internet somewhere around the world and you're not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions in being the point. And got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. Uh, anytime, day or night, you can go to Him in prayer. And He's there. He hears you. Uh, and, you know, I think many times that a lot of you don't have a lot of competition uh, in speaking with our Heavenly Father. It seems everyone is too busy for God. They, they don't have time for Him. They're so busy trying to make a living. Uh, they're so busy chasing their tail, trying to figure out what all this life in the flesh is all about. They, they forget God and be special to your Father talk with him, and, and that makes his day. You make his day, he's going to make yours. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, financial difficulties, uh, addiction to alcohol, drugs, Father. You know if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these, and we always Remember our, and lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, guide, protect, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks around the country. First up today, we have Jim from Florida. Uh, I've had a few questions, but I've forgotten, but the two I haven't, Arnold Murray said, if you make God's day, he'll make yours. My question on that is, how do you make God's day? Well, that's, you, you obey him, for one. That's what his word is. It's instructions or commandments of how to be pleasing to your heavenly father. And if you were a parent and you had two children, uh, one of them disobeyed you and rebelled against every word that you said to them, and the other one was a complete pleasant child who followed your every instruction, uh, which one would make your day? The one who was obstinate and rebellious or the one that loved you and, and followed your request? Secondly, is Dennis going to preach? Well, I guess uh, he's going to preach. He's preaching now, and uh, you haven't been watching the program, I guess, because, you know, we do uh, Sunday messages that are on the third week of each month. So, yeah, we're still around, and, uh, but, you know, we, we still receive a lot of letters from people uh, thanking us for airing uh, Pastor Arnold Murray's teaching still. And we will continue to do so as long as uh, the people are requesting it. Uh, that teaching is still uh, very, very important. Greg in California, what does it mean on the verses about picking up the cross daily and carrying it? Well, uh, in Matthew chapter 16 and Mark chapter 8 is where Jesus said this. And what he's saying is, you know, I was willing to pick up my cross and carry it uh, and be crucified on it, you as Christians should be willing to do the same. Uh, and then you also follow, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. What does this mean in Matthew uh, chapter 6? Uh, Jesus was coming down on the Pharisees uh, who were giving alms, which is uh, a gift to benefit the poor, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. They weren't doing it to help the poor. They were doing it to be seen of other men. In other words, look what a generous person I am. And Jesus said, when you give alms, gifts to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. In other words, do it in secret. Don't do it uh, with a big show and blow the trumpets and beat the drums. Uh, when you do that. Clay in Texas. Where in the Bible is it state not to teach my people to fly away? Ezekiel chapter 13 verses 18, 19, and 20 is what you're thinking about, Clay. 
And it states there that God is against those who teach his children to fly to save their soul. The Lord is coming here. And that's where Christians should want to be, is where Jesus is. Uh, how do I know he's coming here? Because the Bible declares as such. Acts chapter uh, 1, it states there that, that uh, when Jesus ascended from the Mount Olivet, uh, the Mount of Olives, uh, the two angels were there and they said, you men of Jerusalem, what are you standing around looking at? And they said, the way he went up, is exactly how he will come back down. He's coming back to earth. Uh, and you know, that's the reason we should have the gospel armor on is to stand against the fiery darts of Satan. Nobody's flying away anywhere. Matilda in Illinois, uh, thank you for teaching God's word every day. I get up early to listen and you state the station. Thanks also for including uh, your father Arnold and you're, there's another one who enjoys watching Pastor Arnold's teaching still. My question, what book and chapters lists the woes? Well, which woes uh, are you talking about? Uh, in the book of Isaiah, you'll find the woes of Isaiah beginning in Isaiah uh, chapter 28 verse 1. Uh, in Matthew, you have eight woes in Matthew chapter 23, verse, starting with verse 13, and those directly correspond to the eight Beatitudes of uh, Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. <clears throat> what book and chapter tell us the things God hates? You're thinking about uh, Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16, and the following verses. And we also learn that there's a seventh, and if you include it with any of the other six things that gods hate, it becomes an abomination. The seventh thing, of course, listed there is discord. And those who sow discord among the brethren. In other words, those who are troublemakers in church. <clears throat> Naomi in Arizona. I have a question. Would you say that when humans were created and identified as man and woman, was woman perhaps the fallen angels? That's why she's woe man. We will have woe, W-O-E, in our lives because we suffer a lot of violence from man, domestic violence. So do you think woe man means woe, W-O-E, and woe unto us? Is this our lot in life because of the first earth age? Because as I understand it, we were not gender identified in the first world age and will not be in the third world age. I love Shepherd's Chapel program and, and you go on and okay. Well, no, you're way off base on women being the fallen angels. Uh, quite to the contrary, they were able to impregnate women in Genesis chapter 6. And the W-O in woman has nothing to do with the W-O-E, the woes of Isaiah or Matthew or anything else. Irene in Illinois, where in the Bible does it talk about earthquakes, tornadoes, and such in divers places? You'll find what you're looking for in Matthew uh, chapter 24 verse 7, also in Mark chapter 13, verse 8. And these are all part of the signs that this world age is coming to a close. Now, I didn't say the world is coming to an end. I said the world age, a period of time, is coming to close. What happens when that happens? Well, a new period of time uh, begins, and that's the third earth and heaven age. We're in the second at this point in time. Andrew in New York, Jesus gave a couple of scriptures. If someone asks for your cloak, give them your shirt and turn the other cheek. And you're thinking of Matthew chapter 5, verse 40. And that states that if someone sues you uh, to take, take away that coat, give them your cloak also. And it 
uh, follows in Matthew or preceding that in Matthew 5:39 states that whomsoever shall smite thy right cheek turn to him your left and then you continue, when you're being verbally abused, does this mean you should roll over or, or not respond? No, it doesn't mean that you should uh, roll over. Christians are not second-class citizens. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is preparing his disciples to go forth and to teach others. Now, that's specific to his teachers, his disciples. He's saying if you go out and you teach someone truth and you overload their donkey and they reach out and slap you on the cheek, turn the other cheek because it's your fault. You overloaded their donkey. But again, Christians are not second class citizen. If someone just walks up to you on the street and tries to strike you, you knock them on their coon dog, as Pastor Arnold used to always say. Uh, preferably before they strike you. You have the right uh, to defend yourself. You're not somebody's doormat to be walked on. Brent from Missouri, and Brent is obviously a young student. We don't have an age. Dear Pastor Dennis, when I talk to the Father, when I pray, I cry. Do you know why I cry when I pray? Thank you. I love your show. God be with you. Bye. Well, I, I, I think you probably cry, Brent, because you love Father so much that you're, you're humbling yourself uh, by shedding tears before Him. And, you know, the longer that you are a Christian and the, the better you develop your relationship with your Heavenly Father, I think you'll be able to talk to him and not be so emotional. I think young Christians, uh, by that it don't necessarily mean age. I mean someone who may have been off in the world for 30 years and then they find the Lord again. They become quite emotional at times. But when some of that is probably regret uh, for the things that they have done in the past. But you shouldn't feel regret, you should ask for forgiveness and then you have a clean slate and then you can get on with uh, serving the Lord. Raymond in Illinois is worshiping on Sunday the mark of the beast. No, and you obviously don't have any idea what the mark of the beast is and I don't understand why I get these questions from people when every other day, it seems, we offer the free introductory offer uh, at, at our intercession, our break. And the, the Mark of the Beast, the CD is free. The phone call to request the CD is free. We provide you with an 800 number and we don't even ask for postage to mail the CD to you. If you want to know what the Mark of the Beast is, uh, call that 800 number and request the mark of the beast. It's very easy to do. And, and you won't continue to get uh, solicitations from the Shepherd's Chapel wanting you to send money. We'll send you the uh, mark of the beast CD and then if you want to get back in touch with us, you feel free to do so. Uh, we won't be soliciting you and we won't ever sell people's name and address to another organization. We just, we protect our mailing list with our lives, literally. Jim in Illinois, what is your feeling on when someone wants to change their gender? You know, I just don't understand how anyone could be confused about their gender. I mean, God made it to where if you want to know what gender a dog is, you pick that puppy up and you look between his two hind legs and you know instantly what gender it is. That puppy's not confused about whether he's male or female. It's the same with humans, but we only have two legs. Uh, and don't get me started on transgenders using whichever lockers and showers and restrooms they want. Uh, I did a message just recently called Fire, and it tells what I think or what God thinks about those who would make it to where 
transgenders can use whatever restroom they want. I, I, I tell you, I shake my head and you, 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 you get the feeling that this world is going to hell in a fruit basket. Uh, that people are just really crazy and it, it's the leaders of our country that are causing this. Uh, uh, babes shall rule is the, what God's word said. Enough on that. Mary from Wisconsin. I want to ask a question. What else do we look for before the two witnesses will come? Well, Matthew chapter 24, Mark chapter 13 tell you everything that has to happen before Christ returns. Also, the talk about those who murder will not be forgiven in this life. What about David uh, had Uriah killed? Well, uh, the fact that men are, cannot be forgiven of murder in the flesh, you can document in the first epistle of John, chapter 3, verse 15. You know, and a lot of people want to come down on David, uh, but they're also coming down on God uh, for forgiving David. Do you think God doesn't have the power to forgive? Boy, I sure hope so because I depend on that uh, for him to forgive me. Uh, I'm sure, Mary, if you were being honest, you would depend on that power for him to forgive as well. What David did was wrong with Bathsheba. There's no question about that. Uh, God's word doesn't sugarcoat what he did. Uh, it doesn't sugarcoat the consequences of what David paid for that adulterous relationship. And it doesn't sugarcoat the fact that God forgave David. And again, God has the power to forgive. Uh, don't question him. Jim in West Virginia, in Acts chapter 2, verse 45 and 46, I do not understand why the converts sold all their possessions and gave them to other men. Well, you see, at that time, these that converted were going to become teachers. And at this time, the, the Bible was written, you didn't have the technology that we have today that you can push a button, basically. It's a little more complicated than that, actually. But you can reach out to so many people as we do on this television broadcast each day. Uh, they, they didn't have that. They had to travel. Uh, they called it a circuit in some cases. And you had to go to this church and talk to them. And then you went to this church and talked to them. In other words, they sold everything so that they would be able to travel about teaching God's Word. Gregory from Oklahoma. Question, at the six Trump in the five months, will it be five months in God's time or man's time? And he's referring to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, where it states that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. I, I'm not sure which, but and I think it's kind of a mute point uh, because it will be relative no matter what, but I think it will be man's time. Where can I find the true meaning of fight fire with fire about evil and an eye for an eye in God's word? Erlene from Louisiana, I speak a tongue when I am praying that I cannot understand. I think it is the Holy Spirit. It's a wonderful feeling. Will you tell me if it is or not? Acts chapter 2 verse 4 and the following verses uh, probably the most misunderstood uh, chapter in God's Word. Uh, people don't read it. And the, the evidence of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2 was that the people were there from all around the world and spoke many different languages. And the evidence of the Holy Spirit was that everyone understood what was being said even down to the uh, accent or dialect on the county in which they were born. So for someone to speak something that they don't even understand themselves, that's babble, that's confusion. 
And I encourage you, and I know I offend some when I say that, but it's getting late in the game. And if, if you are attending a church where it takes an interpreter for you to understand what one of the congregation is saying, it's not evidence of the Holy Spirit. The evidence of the Holy Spirit is that cloven tongue language that everyone will understand. That's the language that God's elect will speak when they're delivered up, the Holy Spirit speaking through them. Mary in Iowa, are there truly real demonic spirits out there? Yes, there are. Uh, Jesus encountered them in Matthew chapter 4, chapter 8, chapter 9, chapter 12, document that there are evil demonic spirits out there. But we don't have to be afraid of them. Why? We have power over them. Jesus Christ gave us power over all of our enemies as long as we order them out in His name. Uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 and 18. Gene in Louisiana, is rape and murder the unpardonable sin? If not, what is? Rape and murder are capital crimes deserving of capital punishment, but uh, and murder, like you can document in Deuteronomy chapter 19, Numbers chapter 35, rape uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 22, but neither of them is unforgivable. You can read about the unforgivable sin in Luke chapter 12, verse 13 and the following verses. And that's for one of God's election to say what's on their mind rather than allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through them when they're delivered up. I'm out of time and I want you to know that I love you. God loves you because you enjoy studying the letter he wrote to you, the Bible. Unlike others who don't have time for him, you make time each day to spend it studying his word. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? It's because Jesus is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.